Managing the balance of freedom and security in a digital world. The threats against security on the Internet are boundless, complex, and constantly changing. As a consequence of a globalized world order, today's comprehensive and broad security concept places the security of the individual at the center, i.e. the security of the individual should not be undermined for the benefit of the security of the state. How do we effectively ensure security on the Internet with full respect for human rights? So, have you started? Yes, all right. Um, so good morning. Uh, welcome to session number six, which is the balance between um, freedom and security. Um, my name is Robert Guerra. I'm the moderator. I'm the special advisor to the Citizen Lab at the Monk School of Global Studies at the University of Toronto. Um, before I introduce my panelists, I'm just going to uh, talk about kind of the structure of this panel. Um, I'm going to introduce the panelists. I'm going to um, give them a question to answer um, so they can describe a bit more of uh, their roles if they do at their organizations. Um, I'll then ask a, a series of questions for the panel to discuss amongst each other. Um, and then I'll call for questions from the floor. And the floor for me is both all of you that are here as well as the virtual floor that, that is listening. Uh, the issue of security and privacy have been discussed um, yesterday and, and partly today as well. Uh, so you probably have some questions that you've been wanting to ask. Um, please think about them. Uh, for those that are uh, following virtually, please send your questions to FX Internet so the virtual curators can collect them and send them to me. Something that I'm going to do a little bit differently as well is when I ask questions for those at the floor is try to pick up uh, from different um, there's attendees from all over the world, and I see all of you as experts as well. So I will call for questions from um, those of you that come from different parts of the world, and I may ask you a question as well, is what do you see as the balance in your region? And then ask the question, and so I want to capture the perspectives. Um, what I see this panel is that I have uh, some wonderful experts on the panel with me um, who have done different aspects of being able to balance both um, freedom and security in a variety of different roles that they've had. Um, and so I want these experts to be available to you and so you can better understand the complexity of the issue kind of going forward, but also to understand what are the challenges that we face today and what are some of the challenges that we face over the next five to ten years as the internet moves from basically the Western world connecting to the parts of the world that are connected where the values of security and freedom are quite different than what we have here. Um, so in terms of the panelists, the, the bios are available online. I'll just, um, so those of you know, um, Jamie Shea, he's the Deputy Assistant Secretary General for Emerging, Emerging Challenges Division at the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO. Uh, then we have Pauline Neville-Jones, that is the UK Special Representative to Business on Cybersecurity. Then we have Patrick Felström, um, who's Swedish, um, who's the head of R&D at NetNod, and also the chair of um, ICANN Security and Stability Advisory Committee. A uh, bit of disclosure, I'm also a member of the ICANN Security and Stability Advisory Committee. Um, and then um, to my right is Dunja Miatovic. She is the OSCE representative on freedom on the media, uh, and who's with us today. And so. Um, I'll maybe start with, with Jamie. Um, you're with an organization that typically um, is, isn't too present at, at, at these type of fora. And so I'm interested in terms of um, more so from cyber. Um, when did NATO get into kind of internet cyber issues? Uh, if you could give us a little bit of perspective. And emerging challenges. So there must be some threats. And so I'm curious if you can you know, just maybe answer those questions in terms of What's NATO's role kind of in the internet? And um, as an emerging challenge, what do you see as the, the existing emerging challenge right now and maybe five years from now? 
what you see as a challenge? Uh, okay, well, first of all, let me uh, be uh, very thankful to the Swedish Foreign Ministry for inviting me here. You said, uh, Mr. Chairman, that NATO is not always visible or present at these meetings. I think it's good that we are today uh, and that we should do this in, 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 in the future. Um, I don't pretend to have all of the answers uh, in terms of the balance between security and freedom on the internet, but what I would say is that security is, is a serious and an increasingly serious issue, uh, and that if we want to have the freedom, we will in time have to deal effectively with the security issue. You're not going to have one uh, without the other. You asked me when did NATO first get involved in the cyber business, uh, essentially in 1999 when during the Kosovo air campaign we experienced our first significant denial of service uh, cyber attacks. Uh, and they have continued uh, with more or less intensity uh, ever since. Uh, we are no different from any other business or international organization or government which is noticing uh, an increased uh, intensity and seriousness and sophistication uh, of cyber uh, attack. So this is not a problem that we can choose to deal with or not to deal with. We, uh, in the case of protecting uh, our own essential data, in terms of our ability to go about our military activities and operate according to our mandates, we have to have secure access to the cyber uh, domain. It's simply not uh, 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 an option. Uh, we are dealing, I think, with uh, three particular challenges. The first one is that cyber offensive attack capabilities, whether we wish to uh, acknowledge this or not, but the fact is, are growing uh, all the time. Uh, secondly, our dependency, obvious point, but it needs to be made on, on critical technologies to run our command and control systems, to run our military systems, to, to run our decision-making processes, are increasing all the time. A and finally, the asymmetry of cyber makes this a, a formidable strategic challenge. It, it's, it's very difficult for most states or actors to get into the security business. You need a lot of know-how, you need to be able to build tanks, you need to be able to build ships, uh, you need armed forces, it takes a lot of time and effort to build that. It's not the case for the cyber domain where virtually anybody with a modicum of equipment uh, and knowledge uh, can uh, get uh, involved. Secondly, in conventional uh, conflicts, uh, attrition sets in quickly. You run out of money, you run out of capabilities, uh, you run out of territory, you have to stop. You come across geographical barriers. That does not exist in the cyber domain uh, either. Uh, so uh, we are, I think, uh, condemned to live in a world where for a long time to come, the uh, offensive capability, the capability to intrude, to attack uh, cyber uh, networks uh, will be ahead of our ability to defend. That's not to say that we should throw up our hands in despair uh, and be passive uh, and say like Stanley Baldwin, the British Prime Minister in the 1930s, that the bomber will always get through. The history of all military strategy is that over time, and we see this today in the field of missile defence for example, the defence does catch up with the uh, offence. Uh, uh, but we need to think how to do that. Uh, now, what is NATO's role? Well, first and foremost, we have put in our new strategic concept uh, cyber attacks up as a potential Article 5 collective defence uh, contingency. In other words, that we as NATO allies have said that our ability uh, to uh, uh, undertake cyber defence is a vital part of protecting the security of our populations and our citizens, no different from other types of threat, be they missile threats or conventional threats or, 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 or others. Now that doesn't mean to say that NATO is going to instigate an Article 5 collective defence against any form of cyber attack. Of course not. Uh, a lot is going to depend, as always, on on the threshold of the attack, uh, the intensity, the duration of the attack, and the amount of damage equivalent to what would be sustained in the kinetic world that is uh, sustained, and we have to think about that. But the option is open, and, and the fact that NATO has kept the possibility of an Article 5 response is a form of deterrent uh, to anybody who would try uh, to uh, undertake a massive cyber attack against the Allies. So that is significant. However, what I want to emphasize, Mr. Chairman, very briefly, is, is that NATO's role is purely defensive. We do not have, as an alliance uh, at NATO, offensive cyber capabilities. And there are no plans to develop them uh, at NATO. 
Uh, I cannot obviously speak for individual countries, but our role at NATO headquarters is denial of benefits. In other words, simply to make it much harder uh, for people to penetrate our systems, to know about those penetrations earlier, to limit the damage. Uh, we have a cyber policy, a cyber plan of action. What are we focusing on? First of all, we're focusing, of course, on our own networks. Uh, we're improving our detection capabilities. We're improving our forensics. We're improving, improving our ability uh, to attribute the source of attacks. I think this problem, which everybody talks about as seemingly impossible, is not impossible. I believe that this will be solved, attribution, in, in the fullness of time. We're improving our ability to detect attacks uh, and we are stepping up our decision-making uh, procedures for how to deal in terms of decision-making uh, with different types of attack. But beyond this, I think, and I'll say this very briefly because I know my time is almost up, that over the next few years, there is a lot that NATO can do and should do. Number one, uh, we need to help our individual allies to test their vulnerabilities when it comes to cyber threats against critical information systems. What are the core national capabilities that we have that we absolutely need to protect first and foremost? Power lines, energy supplies, uh, scudders which run, uh, for example, uh, important uh, uh, systems. How vulnerable are they and how can we better protect them? NATO is a good place to share expertise and information on these type of things. Secondly, how how can we step up in the Alliance intelligence sharing? We're forming an intelligence cell uh, on cyber threats so that we can have better situational awareness of what may be coming our way and, and be able to uh, warn uh, and deal with these uh, potential attacks at an earlier stage. The next thing is how do we handle a cyber crisis? Uh, if uh, another tally in Estonia 2007 were, occurred, were to occur tomorrow, would the Alliance, and I think the answer now is yes, but would the Alliance be in a better position to handle this uh, last time round in terms of rules of engagement, uh, in terms of how do you think of escalation and de-escalation when you manage a cyber uh, crisis? Which backup, which redundancy uh, do you require to be able to get your vital systems functioning even though they are under attack? What is the minimum functionality here? Should it be provided by the private sector on a contractual basis? Should it be something that NATO has on a full-time uh, basis? But I think even beyond that, uh, we need other things. Uh, a better dialogue with the private sector because you know this better than I, 90% of these networks are not owned by governments, unlike the old territorial uh, limits of sea or, or land, but they're owned by the private sector. So we need good partnerships with the private sector. Who, who is responsible for managing which end of the risk uh, spectrum and for business continuity uh, planning? The other thing uh, is we need better cooperation with other international organisations to determine where we add value uh, and they take over. Uh, and finally, uh, we need to look at the legal aspects. Uh, the, our Centre of Excellence in Tallinn, my final point, Chairman, is currently working with international lawyers to try to define which aspects of current international law and the international law of armed conflicts apply to cyberspace. Where do they uh, cover it? Where do we need to think in future of possibility of new types of regime? And how can we develop, final point, a package of confidence <laughs> and security building measures? Uh, Jamie. <laughs> But it's an important point, just a confidence security building measures, which would gradually bring states around the table. My, uh, my sense of being at some of these meetings is that the NGO community is very geared up to talk about cyber issues. Governments are not. There are far fewer forums where governments, who are the essential stakeholders at this level of threat, uh, meet. And we need to get a forum where governments are sitting around a table debating these issues and, and confidence building measures. So, so I thank you for... Um your, your comments, I think, as, as someone who's long participated in these type of forums, it's not traditionally do we hear from people from NATO or from the military. So having their perspective, I, I think, is important. And, and I kind of before I get to the, to the next uh, panelist, I think, you know, something to keep in mind is you're a very well-resourced actor. You can do all this type of, of work. Uh, what I'm curious for the audience to start thinking about, um, for the other panelists as well too, is um, you're less resourced than other actors. And so the challenges, the resources, um, how do you make that the, the, the choice? Um, so Pauline, for you, in terms of you're the special representative to business on cybersecurity. Um, so from a business point of view, 
what do you see as the, the challenges? Um, what is the, the lack of resources, perhaps, that you, that you have? And I, I think the key thing is, what do you see as the main issue affecting the business group now and in five years? And the reason, again, as I mentioned, five years from now is the population that's going to come online is very different. And so how is that affecting the thinking of the business community uh, in terms of the cybersecurity issues that they uh, face? Right, okay. Um, I'm, uh, I might say that I'm a substitute Libyan. I'm very sorry <laughs> not to be able to provide that degree of, of variety. Uh, as you will see the program, I'm, I've uh, stepped in uh, rather late. Um, the, uh, uh, obviously, I'm working, uh, having come out of government, and I was, in fact, the security minister until May of last year. Uh, and then I decided that I could actually do more constructive uh, work working alongside government, and in particular, uh, trying to implement the part of the government's national security strategy, which includes a developed cybersecurity strategy uh, in the business community. Because as Jamie's just said, a huge part, not the totality, but a huge part of the assets uh, which uh, the cyber world uh, is either possesses or is operating through are in private sector hands. So the private sector is an absolutely crucial player. It's a crucial player, obviously, as a supplier, as an operator, and of course, as a, as a, as a business. Um, one of the things that we are acutely aware of, and, and when you look at what the British say about cyber security, of course we have a national security component. Uh, the military communication is very important. Uh, uh, na critical national infrastructure, uh, homeland security, which Jamie mentioned, are all parts of the system which, uh, as a state and as a society, and really this is a society issue, it's not just a government issue, uh, you know, have to be reliable, they have to be available. Uh, so availability becomes an extremely important priority uh, for the internet. So, uh, so the uh, private sector plays a very crucial role in actually being, being the provider uh, and the securer and the generator of all these services to society. It also, of course, is the means whereby international commerce takes place. Increasingly, uh, transactions are conducted on the internet, both private individuals and business to business. So it, it's, it is how the world goes round. Now, one of the things I would say is that we will expect to see we already know in the UK, we've done calculations on it, we know what increment of uh, extra business is provided by the fact of the internet, over and above the business growth that would otherwise take place. I would expect that to be a global phenomenon. So one of the things we're going to see is expansion. We already have a worldwide, uh, a worldwide activity. This is going to grow in numbers, and one of the challenges, I think, for the future is how you manage that growth and how you actually provide good governance for that growth. Uh, one of the issues, I think, not being discussed here, but, but is very crucial, I think, to uh, two things. One, availability of the internet, which has been talked about, and also its reliability. Jamie's quite right to say that you will not get reliable access and that what I would then call freedom you know, to roam around the internet or indeed to conduct a transaction on it unless you have security built in. These are partners. They are not opposites. They are not, you know, this is not a zero-sum game between security and, and, uh, and freedom. Though I quite recognize uh, that when you get into jurisdictions where the rule of law and the sort of things that I would recognize as being part of the legal framework within which uh, in the internet operates, you know, are not adequate, you are going to find that the, uh, that the internet, quite rightly, and users of the internet are going to provide a challenge to that system. In fortunate countries where you have a rule of law, where you can, you can rely on, on due process, that's less of a challenge. There are still issues. So I would say that my main function at the moment, I expect it to change, my main function at the moment is actually awareness. It's actually getting the business community to understand, first of all, what its role is. And as I say, there are different parts of the business community with different roles. But above all, those uh, companies that have uh, either conducting transactions that they understand uh, the, the security implications for them, and particularly those companies that store their intellectual property in the cloud uh, or wherever they, wherever they have it on the internet system. There is a very serious lack of awareness on the part of companies about the vulnerability of their intellectual storehouse. 
and how, you know, they think it's still there because it's been copied, but it's gone. And we have well-documented instances of valuable intellectual property uh, turning up in other, other jurisdictions, products which have been researched elsewhere, where the costs have been put in elsewhere, being produced at much lower cost, come onto the market first on the basis of theft. Now, this is a very, very serious issue for, no, for uh, a company that actually reckons to make its profit. And for the Western world, but it's true generally, more increasingly in business, it's innovation that counts. It's your ability actually to produce something new. So if you lose that crucial asset, you have actually had a great big puncture in your bottom line. So it's a big issue, and it's a big issue for economic growth. We need to have trust in the internet, and so it's an international issue as well. So that's one side of it. The other side, obviously, of business security is, is combating cybercrime. Uh, cybercrime takes place on our high streets, but it also takes place, of course, in jurisdictions on an organized basis, which are hard to get at. That is an international task, which I haven't talked about, but which is you know, closely allied to the interests of the business community and indeed society as a whole, because ordinary individuals you know, have their, uh, have their uh, bank, uh, bank, you know, their bank account cleared out. Uh, so, there are a lot of business-related issues, and above all, the question is, do people understand how vulnerable they are? Does a company know what the normal functioning of its internet system is? I tell you, there are an extraordinary number of companies that don't know what normal looks like. Well, if they don't know what normal looks like, they won't know what abnormal looks like. They won't know when it's gone wrong. Uh, the CIO and the security people have to be much closer to the board than they are at the moment. The board in many companies is not aware, uh, doesn't understand the importance of their cyber communications and, their, and, and the way in which they're now increasingly operating. Uh, therefore, it's not part of their risk register, it's not part of risk management, which we heard about uh, in the previous session. It needs to be. And so, for com companies, governance is also involved here, and the audit committee. Uh, down the road, there is the question which is now beginning to loom about the extent of the role of the insurance industry. So you can see that the internet is now becoming absolutely embedded in the normal operation of business. And we need to make that you know, as secure as well as free as we can. Great, thank you. Mm. So getting to, to Patrick, so I, I, what's interesting is the way that the, the panelists have all sat each other is that on one extreme we have defense and on the other side here we have um, someone who works protecting people as well. And Patrick, you're in the middle. So you're the engineer that, that brings the different um, groups together. So I'm, I'm curious from uh, an implementer, I guess, in Sweden and working with the different stakeholders here, um, but also at an international level, you know, what I'm curious to hear from you is, um, you know, what do you see as the main kind of threat? But also getting to the topic as well is in terms of the balance. I mean, what... Um, what do you and your colleagues, how do you try to maximize freedom online when confronted with some of the security um, pushes that you get from, from government or from business and elsewhere? So I'd, I'd like to hear your point of view on that. Um, th thank you very much. I think that, first of all, uh, I define security probably a little bit different than, than, than some people in the room. And I, and I think, specifically, I think we have different, uh, different definition of security. So let me tell you what four pieces of I see of security. The first, um, in no specific order, the first one is the ability for law enforcement and equivalent to basically do their job and fight crime. The second one, the ability for people to use encryption and otherwise be sure that the communication is is private or as private as they want themselves, the parties that communicate. The third thing is the ability to have a system that can withstand attacks. And the last one is the ability for systems work, to work at all, robustness and resilience, and the ability to actually get, get communication enabled in the first place. And when discussing these kind of things, I think, uh, and that are related to security, that I would come back to, I think people are mixing, mixing up these things a little bit too much. And sometimes it's easier if, if trying to concentrate on what the actual goal is for a certain discussion. There are specifically two problems, and, and let me first start by saying, just like, just like, um, like many people know, I mostly work with, so far, the ability to get communication in the first place. Because if we don't have internet access, like we don't have in this room because the wireless network doesn't work, 
even though this is not a system under stress. Okay? How can we even start to discuss how we can handle things if it is the case we have a system under stress? So I think, to answer your question directly, what problem will we get five years from now? And the problem will still be that people don't know how to build secure, build robust internet connectivity. Okay, we can start there. So anyway, so, so if I go into more like, okay, so, what are, so should we slice the cake even more? And I think there are specifically two different kind of problems, specifically now when, when, when we have NATO here as well, and um, to decide. I think one problem is to try to increase the ability for the system to work when the amount of stress to the system increases. So we need to, to just like you talk from business side, it's very important that various things that we today call our incidents are not called incidents tomorrow. We need to learn from what has happened. So we need to build a much, much more robust system that would, than, than what we have. But then, as a second problem, we have to talk about, which we just heard from the first speaker, Given that the system has fallen apart, given some kind of stress, how do you ensure that the things that must work still work? And how do we agree on what kind of things we prioritize? What is important? No one really knows that. But on the other hand, I really would like to see that a system like internet and communication should fall apart as, as rarely as the most other stable system you can think of, whether it's water, whether it's electricity or whatever. It must be that stable, and I guess most of you have a more non-stable, sorry, has a less stable internet connectivity at home than water connectivity for the ones in the Western world. Okay, when the internet connectivity is as stable, then we're fine. So, how do we solve this? Well, by talking more to each other, <laughs> just like we do here. But I also think that there are, there, there are another specific problems, I think, in the discussion, for example, between, between private sector governments and, and civil society. And that has to do with that I still see a, a, people talking about telco regulation or st standard regulation and st standard regulative historical view of the world. And then you have this internet thing being something different. So, for example, sometimes I hear people talk explicitly about internet governance and tel telecommunication regulation, like telco governance. I would like to see us start talking about network governance instead. Because in the future, everything will be carried over the internet. And we, what we have to talk about is how to reach the overarching goals. And I think we really have to try to do new design of each one of the various subtopics that we heard a little bit about, that we also probably will hear more about, but when we are looking at each one of those specific subtopics, we need to, in a much different way than before, um, than like 15 and 20 years ago, when we both only had telecommunication, we knew who was responsible, we had incumbents, now we have competition, we have private sector, etc. There are a lot of changes that have happened. It's really, really important that each one of those sort of silos, when they do the work, they have to look much, much more global, because we have many, many more in interdependencies between the various areas and things are much more intertwined. And let me take one example, which, which is, for example, let's say that there is an attack on a serious system. The system is quite often like run by different kind of parties. Someone is owning the fiber, someone runs the service, some private sector delivered the hardware or whatever. I do not believe we anymore can have sort of someone coming in and take over that. Instead, the system must be robust already when being installed, which means that we need to have all of these defense mechanisms already installed from the beginning. After something has happened and we have problems, for example, like Estonia, where I helped myself personally in Estonia when, when that happened, we learn from those mistakes. We learn from what kind of problems we have, and that can com be compiled and should be compiled by people that have the experience of looking at what actually happened. That then come with recommendations on and, and that can also be a multi-stakeholder process. There can be recommendations on how to adjust the system to ensure that we don't run into the same problem again next time. We feedback that into whatever kind of things we're doing and, and build more robust system. So we, over time, increase the robustness of the communication. Because I still think for freedom of the internet compared to security, the biggest problem is that we cannot communicate at all yet. Okay. 
Dunya, the question that I have for you is, in your role at the OSCE, um, what do you see as the, the biggest type of um, issues that your, your office is facing in regards to the requests from those that are, that are denied access because of um, things that they do online, and, and what is a way to correct, at times, the state security that is using the pretext of security to silence right to freedom of, um, and expression? Um, so I'm, I'm just curious, what are some um, you know, the, the key topics that, that you're handling? And after you're done, um, I'm going to um, ask one question to the panel and then come back to, to the floor. So, Junya. Thank you, Robert. Uh, before I um, reply to your question, I just have to say that I'm, um, you know, a bit lost <laughs> um, because I was listening uh, to everything uh, my colleagues in the panel were, were saying, um, and I know that the topic of our panel is uh, managing the balance uh, of freedom and security. And the only thing I heard, actually, from uh, all three of you is uh, tax, uh, uh, security, um, you know, uh, crime, um, you know, all these sort of tools that we need to, to introduce. But uh, freedom was not, you know, mentioned, maybe was by you mm. only once. Um, so, um, in a way, um, you know, it's also very important uh, for you to know that I'm not representing an NGO. I'm, I'm working for the only intergovernmental media watchdog um, in the world, which is actually monitoring the compliance uh, of media freedom commitments of 56 participating states. So, I'm not talking on behalf of uh, civil society only. And um, I must say that I'm quite puzzled <coughs> not only by this discussion, but uh, globally, the discussions in relation to security and human rights in general. Because I do think that this, you know, hasty uh, decisions and fear that we, we um, notice all around the world when it comes to um, internet are something that are actually, you know, producing censorship um, all over the place. Um, and I would like to use the quote, fortunately it's not mine, but it's a quote from president of Columbia University, Lee Bollinger, who said a few years ago, censorship um, anywhere, censorship everywhere. Um, and the way uh, we approach these issues by certain international organizations, and Jamie mentioned something which is extremely important, cooperation of the international organizations, I do not think we do cooperate properly uh, when it comes to these issues, and that we are, you know, quite ready um, to, to push away uh, human rights and freedoms uh, for the sake of security. I'm also very realistic in um, performing my job by uh, really paying uh, enormous attention to the fact um, that there is a legitimate right of any government to provide safe and secure environment for the citizens. But um, actually looking at my work in the past two years, um, there was no one single occasion when I raised my voice in order to uh, attract attention um, if the country was blocking or filtering or, um, you know, basic maybe issues, putting bloggers behind bars, uh, that that was related to any kind of security. It was to silence uh, critical voices, it was to stop people of, you know, expressing their own views, and everything, you know, was explained um, in a way that this is for the sake of security of the countries. So it is, you know, it's not uh, an easy topic we are discussing today. Um, I'm in a way allergic to any kind of balance because I think, you know, security, there is no security without freedom and there is no freedom without security. So I do not think we should, you know, even, you know, accept to start balancing this. Um, but that's, that's my own um, um, opinion about this. So, um, in a way, I think it's uh, very important uh, that we, um, we are discussing this. But we also cannot uh, and should not forget um, about uh, the issues that are related uh, to the countries we do not have access to. Uh, we do not have possibility um, to um, really talk to the governments, because the governments are creating electronic curtains, they are creating mind walls, um, they are creating all these sort of, you know, possible ways of, of um, you know, uh, actually blocking their citizens in engaging in this uh, global dialogue of, of ideas. And that's why I think it's extremely important that international organizations like NATO, 
uh, for example, or UN or um, any other. I mean, we were very much aware of what's happening at the UN recently. I mean, some attempts by certain governments to introduce uh, uh, informational code for information society that would put, um, you know, UN on top of the internet regulation, which I think it's, you know, not only scary, but I hope it will never happen. Um, so, um, cooperation within you know, this uh, uh, fora of international organizations is something that I would like to see, but unfortunately that is not happening because each of these organizations are doing what is in their mandate, and of course they, they have to do it. But when it comes to joint voice in protection of human rights, I do not think we are vocal uh, and loud enough. Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll forego maybe my question and just want to go um, to the floor. So, as I mentioned, what I'm going to do a little bit differently is um, I'm going to ask if there's any question from someone here from Latin America. So if I have a hand from someone, and I know some of you are here, anyone from Latin America? If not, I will ask Katitza at front. <laughs> um, what do you see as the, the main issues related to security and freedom in Latin America? Is the balance towards security or freedom? Um, and so I'd like to get your perspective on the challenges in, in the region, and then if you have a question for the panel. You need to get the mic. Can we get a microphone, please? Could you stand up? I think it's the way to identify you. And, if, if, yeah. and also, if you could introduce yourself and the organization you're with, please. Thank you. Okay, um, I was interested to talk about the U.S. cybersecurity strategy. I mean, Latin I could American do it later, <laughs> but I could provide a Latin American perspective on cybersecurity. Um, there is not so much in the region developed as far as I'm, uh, I'm aware of cybersecurity. I do know that there, for instance, in Peru, in my country, currently there is discussions about implemented uh, cybersecurity strategies. Like many countries in the world, there are comparing, uh, comparing national cybersecurity strategies to try to imp implement it at national level. And this is happening also in Peru. And I think that some of the proposals that are floating around there might come from the US. Because the US just have sometimes uh, foreign policies agendas, um, is being discussed in, uh, you know, in the United States. I'm, I'm sorry, it's US, but it also affects uh, other parts of the world. And some of the proposals are there are just trying to increase Increase. There's no clear objectives of what they are actually the assets that they are trying to protect and the threats they are trying to fight against. And because of that, they are putting in legislation ways to just bypass uh, privacy laws, um, civil liberties protections, trying to put more obligations on internet companies and ISPs to monitor internet users and so filter and block. The panel. So the question, and it's a problem. A question yeah. for the panel? Uh, I don't have a question for the panel besides. Okay. <laughs> if you right. have, no, no, I have. Uh, do you have any plan to in include privacy or civil liberties issues in, for instance, in the NATO discussion or in the business sector? For instance, the info sharing agreements or the private partnership agreements on cybercrime and cybersecurity. Um, they are taking into account the privacy implications of um, those agreements. For instance, in countries where there is data protection laws, like in many countries in Latin America, okay. not in the US, mm -hmm. but Great. in Latin America. So what was the question? Well, I, well first of all, thank, thank you for that, but I have to sort of clear up any misunderstandings from the word go. I mean, NATO's job is not to regulate international cyberspace. That's not our role. Uh, we're not a norm-setting organization, number one. Number two, our job is not to deal with the issue of individual uh, access to the internet or private citizens. Uh, the EU is much more involved in that area. We are basically dealing with the issue of protecting our own critical information infrastructure against attack so that, as Patrick said, we are able to trust it uh, and to use it uh, and also to help allies to protect their critical information uh, infrastructure so that NATO, therefore, can function. Uh, so that's it. So we, I can have my own private views on the issues that you mentioned, but, but this is, uh, just to be clear, not something which so, this so organization is doing. from the question in regard to privacy taken into advantage in terms of some of the cybersecurity stuff that NATO is working on, that's not being considered at all? Is no, that that's not I mean? an aspect that we uh, okay. are dealing right. with. So, from your perspective in terms of um, the business, in terms of how it's wanting to, to develop some of this, well, what... I mean, what you know, the, uh, uh, business has its own interest in, in, in its own assets. There's a much, much broader issue, which I think the questioner is referring to, which is the 
uh, the rights of individuals to the privacy of their personal data, uh, what government does with that data, uh, and to the uses to which it can be put by outside organisations. I think we're at the very foothills of actually understanding all the implications of freely floating information all around the world. People put on to the internet quite freely a great deal of personal information about themselves and then they're surprised it's exploited. Uh, so actually, first of all, there is a personal responsibility in understanding that what you need, uh, the, the, your own personal uh, responsibility to yourself about uh, your in the information about you. Uh, but there's also clearly, you know, when it comes to uh, government providing services, which increasingly governments do all around the world through the internet, and in order to be able to do that, they demand data. Uh, what is their obligation then to keep that data confidential? Uh, what, is the, what are the codes of access that, there can be, uh, that government agencies can have to that? Uh, what are the obligations and the penalties which government agencies or indeed private organisations that are careless with that data and let it out onto the internet? All of these things are real hazards. And I would say that we are, I think, collectively around the world right at the beginning of actually understanding some of these implications. And secondly, beginning to regulate all of that remotely, satisfactorily. So I wouldn't want to say to you that I think that we have got to the stage where we understand what we need to do. And I would also say that quite a lot of the legislation, I think, that at the moment is being passed by individual countries, or for that matter is being proposed by an organisation like the European Union, will need modification over time, because we won't get it right first time round. I doubt very much. Uh, and it's some of the most difficult issues that we have to deal with, which is the business of how you protect the individual uh, in a context in which actually the individual has now acquired a good degree of power in relation to no, in, in relation to the state. Because that's, what, that's what's happened. I mean, I agree with those who said yesterday there's been a transfer of power inside the hierarchies of society. Individuals are now much more powerful in relation to the state. They don't realize that, but they are. And collectively, hugely powerful. But it means bringing into, bringing into operation quite a number of protections both ways. What the state you know, should, do, should be able to do with information and what the individual uh, should be able to protect. Uh, and what the obligations of the two parties are. And this is, a very, this, is a, this, is, this is a real challenge to democracies. And of course, it's a huge challenge in societies that don't, haven't actually got a sense of what the rights of the individual are. So Patrick, you wanted mm. to jump in. Mm. Did you want to comment as well? So I'll, I'll comment after you do. Yeah, yeah I, I think, f first of all, there were, um, my apologies regarding freedom, because <laughs> that I missed that word, because I immediately jumped into my view, what is needed to feel the freedom is the ability to communicate. And that's okay. when, that, that was my, so, and, but anyways. Good excuse. It, 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 I'm trying to dig, cl crawl out of the hole where I'm digging down myself. <laughs> anyways, so the, the problem I see is when we are trying to, is, is, are these four things that I brought up, the f to be able to fight crime, to be able to encrypt and feel trust for the communication, withstand attacks and get robustness. It is when we are trying to resolve each one of those issues, that is when we might have problems, because we are having all different kind of weird dis discussions about who is responsible to resolve that issue. If it is the case that you are conflicting goals, where are those resolved and how? In what four are those kind of things resolved? That's where I think we have, the res have, have, the, have sort of the stress in the discussion. So I completely agree that security and freedom, it's not the security or freedom. The, the problem ends up when we are looking at each one, each one of the individual problems. So let me just by, end by saying that, that this shared responsibility, to take one example why I got one question directly um, on, on Twitter that my analogy with water was pretty bad. Yes, maybe it was. But let me phrase it this way. We already today see that we build out internet more globally than what we have electricity. Okay, so that's why I'm trying to compare a little bit more water. We are trying to get water all over the world. We're trying to get internet access all over the world. So that was a little bit what I was trying to say. And the reason why I th I, I'm not really sort of completely against regulation. What I'm against is regulation that we that we create before we know why we want it because it's so risky that we are putting the wrong responsibilities on the wrong parties. And I can just refer to the discussion about the roles and responsibilities for intermediaries, specifically in this shared environment we're in. Um, so before I go to, I've, I've seen a couple of hands, I want to go to the virtual floor. 
Are there any questions from, um, from online? Yeah, basically the, the, the most recent question is actually to, to NATO. Um, well, considering that the internet is a, is a free space without borders, how come the NATO will only protect their allies and not the cyberspace and all? Well, uh, you have to start somewhere, right? Uh, you know, not, Rome was not built in a day. And so clearly NATO's first job is to make sure that our own members uh, who all interact together on operations such as in Afghanistan uh, recognize the same minimum standards because, uh, as you know, in the cyber area, you're only as strong as your weakest link, uh, given the increasing way in which these things are networked. For example, one of our biggest challenges at the moment in NATO is to figure out what happens to NATO information when it goes out of NATO collective systems into national systems, and who is then responsible for the protection of that information, as so many different networks connect. In other words, which are the vital national networks linking to NATO networks that we have to ensure first and foremost? Um, and we have a situation in the alliance, uh, let's be frank, with 28 allies where some countries have taken the cyber threat very seriously, have invested heavily uh, in it, have set up proper national structures to manage uh, major cyber attacks and cyber crises, have set up very productive dialogues with the private industry over risk management, and other allies have done far less, have been, I wouldn't say in denial, but have woken up rather late. And, and therefore, one of the big challenges we face, apart from information intelligence sharing, is to what degree are those countries which have good cyber defense capabilities willing to share those capabilities with the other allies uh, for training, for crisis management, in the way that NATO shares tanker aircraft or shares satellite capability or whatever. But very quickly, yeah, sorry, I have to stop. Um, but we are working with partners. Uh, we have a network, uh, a global network now of partners, 22 non-NATO countries are with us in Afghanistan, and we've started with seven of those partners, an act, uh, including Australia, New Zealand, uh, in the Asia-Pacific region, an active dialogue on cyber. Uh, and our center of excellence works with the academic community, legal community, and well. So I honestly believe that you know NATO is not sort of a, an ivory tower unto itself. We have to first establish our own credibility uh, and then see what we can do to pass on the know-how to others. So there's, there's a question over there. Um, I'm going to pose a question for you to think about while we get that question. That's and very that kind is, of you. If, if NATO is <laughs> protecting itself, who's protecting the internet users? And what's the best type of thing for the average user that gets attacked or the small NGO that's here? What are the defense mechanisms and what's the best uh, way to leverage all the resources to help them? So let's think about that. Let's get a question from over there, please. Sir, uh, who are you? you. Um, Where are you uh, from? Carlos Dada from El Salvador. Uh, I have just a quick question for uh, Mrs. Dunia Mijatovic. Uh, as compared to post 9-11, where security was uh, put as uh, the biggest uh, priority in the public discourse. As, as, as compared to the post 9-11 days, would you say freedom is now in a better shape or are we going backwards? Should I answer now? Well, it's um, you know, something that not, you know, uh, it's not the first time I hear yeah. this uh, question. This is something that many scholars and uh, many organizations are trying to, to answer to see if the, the freedom is in a better shape. I do not think so because um, the fear uh, that was produced uh, all over the world uh, in relation to the attacks uh, is uh, something that is uh, pushing so many countries to introduce um, laws um, that are um, not discussed with uh, civil society. Um, there are several occasions where I raised my voice and I intervened with the governments that uh, adopted the laws overnight in order to protect citizens. Um, in many occasions it's um, legitimate to do this because there is a need that we live in a um, secure uh, environment where there is a rule of law. But again, um, the moment you look into this law, this law is affecting freedom of speech, uh, freedom of information, access to information in so many ways. Um, so uh, it is proving uh, that any kind of, you know, I come from um, the region which uh, actually experienced uh, conflict, former Yugoslavia, 
Um, so I do not think even you know, before 9-11, we had certain threats that actually reflected um, not only in the society uh, that was uh, suffering, uh, but also globally in order to introduce something um, that would stop this kind of uh, events in the future. Unfortunately, this is uh, not the case. And uh, um, my answer to this is that uh, even more uh, transparency, more free media, more free speech is the answer we should hear uh, from, from the government. I think the <coughs> perfect example is the Norwegian government and the way uh, they um, uh, reacted to uh, the tragic events with the Bruvik that we are now witnessing um, the trial. Um, and this should be an example for others how to, to fight um, these kind of issues. Um, not introducing more restrictions, not introducing uh, more laws that are affecting free speech. So unfortunately, I cannot um, give you an answer that would be, yes, we are living in a you know, the society where there is more freedom. We are more afraid for freedoms uh, and uh, the, it is a reflection of fear. I'm, so. I'm more optimistic than that. I mean, mm. I think we are a good deal freer than we were during the Cold War. Uh, there was a period immediately up between Cold War and 9-11, I think, where people had a marvellous sense of freedom, you know, without fear. You're quite right, that you know, fear has certainly entered, fear and lack of trust has certainly entered the world since 9-11 since and various other bombings as well. Uh, but actually, there's a great deal more challenge to tyranny than was. If, uh, if the whole business of flow of information, we didn't know half the time what was going on in the world. And so, ignorance was bliss, but it didn't mean to say it wasn't happening. Now, we actually do know. So I would say that the fact of knowing and the fact of challenge to it, you know, and to, to authoritarianism and to, res and to repression in the world, uh, is a sign of stirring you know, of the human spirit. So I am, I am more optimistic about our ability, actually, to deal, to challenge authoritarian regimes uh, than uh, was the case in the past. So um, is the world uh, freer than it was? Uh, possibly not, but I think that we've got some real instruments now for actually improving the situation and the lot of ordinary individuals in the world. C could I just briefly come in on this, just to have a discussion? Mm. I, uh, I, you I know, I'll, I'll share my perspective, because on, on my perspective, from someone who comes from Canada, um, and, and seeing is that a lot of the legislation that was introduced as an emergency for 9-11, that was supposed to have a limited time, that was supposed to be rolled back, has not only not been rolled back, but has actually been extended. And so my, my greatest fear is that those of us in, in, in the West that are privileged to have the freedoms that we do, our countries set the example for many other parts of the world. And if we don't do it right and show that, as in the case of Norway, that we try to strike a balance and show that that's possible, mm -hmm. then whatever we do will be used by other countries without rule of law. So in a way, the previous panel was also talking about kind of equipment that's sold all over the world um, that in Sweden or elsewhere requires a due process to activate certain mm -hmm. set of features. You sell it around the world and it can use, be used for anything. And that's countered by a great deal more challenge than we had in the but, past. Yeah. But, but the laws as yeah. well, we set, there are a lot of countries that set examples. And if we pass mm -hmm. laws that are more restrictive and if we are more challenges, and th no doubt there are, but how we discuss it, how we engage it, how we come to that is, is, is important. So you wanted to make a point, and then we got a question at the back, yep. and then we'll go online. Rob, very briefly, yes, I, I also wanted to make the point that it's important, without being Eurocentric in this global forum, but it is important that here in Europe, we get that right, so we have a model. You could argue that if Europe gets it right on climate change, it doesn't necessarily have a global impact because we're not the major polluters. But here in the area of the internet, if we have a model that's right, it makes it much harder for others to accuse us of double standards. But more importantly, I, I think that this, this business of state control and the individual is very much cat and mouse. I'm not talking now as a NATO official, more as an interested uh, uh, observer, but you see in lots of places around the world where governments are trying to filter the the internet or to shut down websites. People demonstrate enormous ingenuity using USB yeah. sticks, using DVDs. The, you know, the, the internet somehow manages to, uh, to, to uh, uh, overwhelm some, some of those attempts. So I'm not belittling 
uh, uh, the, the, the uh, importance, uh, well, the, the problem, uh, the risk of government control, uh, but, but the jury is still out on that. Secondly, though, I think one thing we need to pay attention to in our own democratic societies is what kind of institutions do we have between governments who even in democracies have a natural tendency, obviously, to want to know what their citizens are doing and to, uh, 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 and to uh, use these uh, information technologies to gather information, even in democracies, and on the one hand, a private citizen. What kind of things do we put between them? You know, things like, for example, in the media, a press complaints commission, parliamentary committees, the right of appeal if you feel that your website has been wrongly uh, shut down. Uh, the, the, you know, the, this is, you know, we've got in many other mm -hmm. aspects uh, yeah. in a democracy, a uh, filter institutions. Uh, between government and citizen, but I think in the internet these kind of filters have still got to fill it. That's probably not a good word, but intermediaries uh, have still got to be uh, e established. Uh, for example, how many parliaments are really knowledgeable about these things and active on these issues? Do you want to comment? Just uh, you know uh, about uh, what you said uh, and the importance of um, so-called if I may say, all democracies, paying attention to what they do because it has enormous uh, reflection in the outside world. Um, I just remember uh, an issue in UK where uh, David Cameron said, you know, maybe you know, he was uh, upset or he didn't mean it. He said, you know, the internet in these situations like this should be shut. We should, and it you know, did not happen and it will not happen. <laughs> no, no, I know, but let me, let, let me finish. Is let, it me did finish. Not exactly. let me finish. Let me finish. After, uh, you know, that, the first government that applauded this was China. Yeah, you know, so those are the reflections. So it's not just UK. There are many other governments, you know, all democracies doing this. And what is happening with the old, uh, with the new emerging democracies? They're of course following. You know, and me in performing my job, I need, um, you know, examples, good examples, good practices in order to uh, force governments that are not complying with the media freedom commitments. Um, to, to follow this. And uh, it is not that easy. People are always, you know, finding the way to, to, to find or to, to get rights that are denied to them. Um, but it's not that easy. You know, governments uh, in Central Asia, in so many countries, are creating regionet. They are creating actual mind walls as we speak. And, you know, they are inventing new ways of, of suppressing their citizens in expressing their views. So, um, you know, I, I agree with you that we are uh, living in a world where access to information and that we are sharing more information than ever before, but there are also huge uh, and extreme attempts by so many governments to stop this. So this is affecting um, you know, our, our life uh, on a daily basis. You wanted to comment? Yeah, I wanted to go back to your question on who are protecting, you asked who are protecting the user? Yeah. Okay. Against what? Because. <laughs> Depending on who you ask, if you ask sort of someone that today in today's society is protecting the 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 sort of the citizen, the police, uh, a parliamentarian, uh, a business, all of them would say I do, or there is a risk they do. But if you ask someone else, do that party protect the the citizen? You might get a no answer. Okay, so I think. What we have to talk about is like who are protect, who is ensuring or who is protecting the user to, in, to who is securing the ability for the user to communicate and feel trust and feel interested of actually uh, doing some transactions on the network. And there, there is, this is where I think we come back to what I talked about, the shared responsibilities mm. between all different kind of parties, where it might be the case that we need to have some kind of regulation that protects businesses or clarifies businesses. Businesses have to take the proper, d proper decisions in their social responsibilities framework. We have to have ISPs and other kind of intermediaries that do their job of actually building robust and resilient networks so the, so the network works when the user wants to communicate because if you try, you want to do your banking online the first time, and it doesn't work. How long time will it take before you try the second time, et cetera, et cetera. But we should also remember that the end user itself has a much more responsibility themselves. And every one of us as a customers, including public sector as a customer, because in the old days when we had one incumbent telco that not only owned the copy line to the house, but also the phone, okay? I couldn't reconfigure the phone, but I can reconfigure my computer. So we have 
So when, we are when all of us, any of us, connect something to the internet, it ends up being part of the internet. So all of us are bringing something to the table, and that's why we have this shared responsibility, so we are protecting each other against stupid things. So we had a question there in the back, I think. Nope, all right, so I'll go up, up here. Keep your question short. And then after Wolfgang, we will go back online, and we'll take two questions online. Okay, by the way, uh, Bruce Nair always argues that the biggest security risk is the end user. So, but um, anyhow, uh, the, uh, my question goes to Jamie. You know, the, uh, one of the big fighters for uh, cybersecurity is the Russian government. They want to use the first committee in the United Nations to negotiate a new treaty on cybersecurity. It's 23 pages. If you go through the text, yeah. then you say, and they say, want to renationalize and re-territorialize the internet. You made clear that NATO is not a, a lawmaking body, but you have consultation on a regular basis with the Russian government. How you discuss this issue of the cyber crime, uh, cybersecurity convention in, well, in the next meeting? Yeah, the, the, we, we, the Russians actually have sent us the, the text, which involves also certain Central Asian parties as, as, as well. Uh, first of all, NATO, NATO's job isn't to negotiate a, an international treaty. Number one. Number two, I think the view of most allies on this would be, yes, have a dialogue with the Russians, obviously. Uh, it's a way of uh, getting transparency, building confidence, finding out exactly what their intentions are. But a treaty is going to take years and years and years to negotiate. Uh, and we can't wait for years and years and years before we have more intergovernmental cooperation in, 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 in cyberspace. Uh, also, to negotiate a treaty now, while cyber is such a dynamic area, uh, may not necessarily be conducive to having cyber security. It's Establishing certain standards, in fact, could be oh, negative freedom. in that respect. So I think it's too early to try to sort of pin down the cyberspace as part of an international treaty. So what I think our view would be vis-a-vis -vis Russia in the NATO-Russia Council, and Minister Lavrov, who in fact was meeting NATO foreign ministers this morning, is to try to think of what can we do in the meantime which would really help to create trust. For example, should we have cyber declaratory policy? We have nuclear declaratory policy. We, we actually say clearly what is the function and role of nuclear weapons. Should governments do the same vis-a-vis -vis, uh, cyber? Secondly, can we have an agreement that no state will uh, tolerate third-party proxies launching cyber attacks from its territory? Uh, could we have an agreement that uh, states will cooperate uh, if there is a minimum level of attribution that says that attacks are coming from their territory and, and provide data and allow international inspectors? Should we set up something like the International Atomic Energy Agency, albeit much more modest, to start looking at confidence building and so on in the cyber area? Can we have an agreement uh, that certain so-called targets, in inverted commas, uh, hospitals, critical infrastructure, water supplies, would never yeah, be the subject? Yeah of a cyber attack. So I, I think, frankly, this, this is the way to go uh, uh, and not the notion that we're going to see an international uh, legal treaty such as a conventional weapons convention or a non-proliferation treaty type of regime anytime soon. So we have a waving hand there. Um, and then, as I promised, then I take two questions online. So please, go ahead. Thank you. Hello, I'm Jeremy Zimmerman. I'm the co-founder of La Quadrature du Net, but uh, also I'm, I'm a hacker in the primary and original sense of the term, which is a technology enthusiast. We like to understand how technology works, not to be trapped into technology and hopefully make it work better. And from my um, modest experience with security, uh, well, cybersecurity is real, but cybersecurity is mostly addressed through uh, human process, best practices, um, the sharing of information, sensibilization to those practices. And this is enabled by a free and decentralized communication platform that is the internet and with freedom of expression and freedom of communication, not by centralizing power uh, in the hands of governments or governmental agencies or militaries, which in my view is an um, upcoming trend with the um, political storytelling using fear-mongering arguments of cyber war, cyber threat, cyber attack, anonymous, WikiLeaks, and so on. Was that a comment? Do you have a question? Uh, I'd like to hear the, um, the opinion of the panelists uh, to about your, that. To your comment? Yes. Please. Okay, so you're directing it to... Oh, I agree, I agree. I mean, I agree with what you said. 
Okay. I, I certainly yeah. agree, yeah. And, and I'm on, in writing <laughs> saying this, that we should certainly not overhype the cyber threat. Absolutely. Uh, you can see me saying this in a publication yeah, called yeah, Europe's World. Uh, to talk about the cyber problem is not to overhype. I personally don't believe in cybergeddon. Uh, I don't personally believe that a war will be totally won or lost in, in cyberspace. I think that future conflicts will have a cyber dimension. That's absolutely clear. I also believe, as I said, that eventually we'll get to grips with a security problem as we have in other areas of strategy, even though it may take time. But to, but you should not go from one extreme to the other. Because I, like you, don't believe in cyber Pearl Harbor or cyber Geddon. Let's go to the, not go to the other extreme and believe that this is just sort of electrons, uh, you know, confronting each other innocently in a virtual world. It is a significant problem uh, in terms of espionage, in terms of uh, constant monitoring to determine uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, it, it's a problem in terms of intellectual property loss. I mentioned these type of things earlier. Pe companies are going bankrupt and people are losing jobs because because of this type of activity. The United States, the Obama administration calculates that 60% of all companies which have experienced a significant cyber attack go bust, uh, and that has consequences for people's lives. So I agree with you, you know, let's not overhype the threat, but, but let's not believe that you know, this is something which has been yeah, but overplayed Jay, that either. That has to do with the company's vulnerability, and it's very yeah, often that the company has taken risks that it ought not to have taken. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is you know, uh, getting into a different sphere. What I would say about, about uh, the relationship between what's likely to happen on cyber and you know, rising tension and you know, physical warfare is that, that I think we will see in the future that when there is incipient conflict, and I think both Georgia and Estonia showed this, that when you have rising tension, one of its manifestations <laughs> is, is will, will be actually attacks coming from who knows where, you know, unacknowledged. One of the real problems, obviously, of cyber is the question of attribution. Uh, but which actually is designed to destroy the capability of the other side, and you know, actually to run not necessarily their military machine, but actually their government. Because if they can't run the government, they clearly aren't going to be able to fight effectively either. So it's an extremely good way of taking down an enemy's capability. And we will see that. We will see that. So that, you know, what, what cyber does is to bring that kind of tension and that kind of conflict right into civil society, right into the functioning of normal daily government. You wanted to make a comment, and then I'm taking two questions from the internet. Please. Yeah, I, I completely agree that it will take years and years and years to agree on good treaties that actually will be effective. Mm. One of the small details we have is that the ITU is currently renegotiating and making decisions on treaties this fall in a couple of months. The previous treaties were written in 1988, and they were good enough to both allow deregulation and the creation of the internet. And the question is whether the treaties we write this fall will be general enough to allow whatever the next thing is that we're going to do the next 30 years. It's going to be much that harder will, now, I think. Yeah, but that will be probably the biggest challenge at the moment because, mm -hmm. as I said earlier, we are not ready. We don't know who is going to be responsible for what. So, so, so casting in stone this fall, what each party is going to be responsible for, I think, is, is, is a very high risk. Two separate questions from the internet, please. Um, yeah, thank you. I think, actually, the Twitter feed is quite worried about the discussion. Uh, and mainly because there's a feeling that this discussion is about protecting governments from the internet and not really internet from, the gov from governments. Mm. which maybe it should be the, the discussion. So, so the question, I have tried to collect questions uh, <laughs> regarding the fact that, I mean, talking about online and offline as, as, a, as a parallel, when, when things like hacking or hacktivism or even social protests, free newspapers or public information is considered in some countries to be dangerous, where, where do you draw the line for cybersecurity? I mean, during this session, we actually got a comment from Mon Mons Adler from Bambuser telling us that Bambuser is blocked in Kazakhstan, as of now, for instance. Hmm. Do you want to take? That's, I mean, I said the same at the beginning. Um, and, um, you know, uh, the, the, the opinion uh, on um, the issues uh, that were raised by uh, uh, people uh, using Twitter um, Kazakhstan was mentioned, uh, you know, that's one of the countries where you have blockages uh, happening on, on a daily basis and it's, uh, um, you know, all the time explanation we hear is related to the security of the citizens in Kazakhstan. In Kyrgyzstan, um, several days ago, um, um, there were um, websites blocked, again, um, because of security, but it was actually because uh, of uh, critical um, 
um, articles uh, that were um, focused on the president of the country. Um, in Tajikistan, you had Facebook blocked for I don't know how many days, plus several news um, uh, websites. So um, what we need to, to, to do, in my view, is we, we should stop living in a bubble, our own bubble where we feel you know, protected, uh, without thinking what is happening in the outside world. And um, in a way, if um, you know, this uh, topic of security and freedom is continuously discussed uh, without uh, bearing in mind what is actually happening in the countries that need our help, that need international organizations to engage more um, in order to, to help uh, citizens by opening up and not closing, um, then you know, we, we are going in the right direction. If not, we are in a way, um, we run the parallel in, in my, in my um, uh, view that both will be conquered, security and, and, and human rights. Um, because again, I do not think uh, that any of these uh, two issues can be uh, provided without the other. Mm -hmm. Another question from the internet. Um, we just got report, reports from Kazakhstan, by the way, that live journal is unblocked. So it's a mm -hmm. good thing. Uh, well, talking about balance, is there is there a balance between fighting crime and terrorism, and on the other side, ensuring right to anonymity, strong encryption, and privacy? So maybe is for, it possible for, for both of you. Maybe you start the question, and then you have mm -hmm. answered that question yeah, as well. F from a from a pure technical perspective, yes it is, because if it, well, it, it might have, because if it is the case that as part of the fighting, if you believe that as part of fighting terrorism and, and other kind of crime, you want to be able to give the tool to law enforcement or whoever is doing the fighting to be able to find the criminal, yes, you need to be able to trace where they could trace the communication one way or another. So, uh, so from a pure technical perspective, I would say yes, there is a conflict between the two. But I, I think that is that is it is very clear that there are some real real dilemmas posed. Um, there isn't any doubt that uh, the single most effective way of uh, finding the source of a terrorist uh, uh, plot or a successful action uh, is through communications. That just I mean it's you know, it just is the case. Uh, that does mean. Uh, the government does have to ask for information which would normally not be available to it and which we would wish you know, in an ideal world did not need to be available to it. And so one of the whole most difficult areas actually is the protections that need to surround that, uh, the circumstances in which that information can actually be made available to government and you need a warranting system without doubt. Uh, and the uh, legal uh, framework and the, invig the, vi the invigilating role, certainly in the UK, of the courts in the operating of, on the operation of that system. Um, uh, it was well said earlier on, you know, the, you said, I think, uh, that a whole lot of legislation has been brought in as a result of or following 9-11 of a kind, which one could wish uh, democratic societies hadn't, hadn't introduced. I couldn't agree more. And I must say that as soon as we can get that legislation off the statute book, it will be a victory for freedom. I don't have any doubt about that. And I also do accept you know, that when people see these models, there are models which can be used by other governments you know, which have less good motives uh, to repress their population. I accept all of that. I mean, I th it is one of the real hazards of life. So um, I'm, not, I'm not arguing that these things are desirable. I am arguing, sadly, that I think they are necessary, but they should only be on the statute uh, book of any country for the period of a genuine threat and for as long as it is really needed. And that is a matter, you know, that legislators, above all parliaments, and it's where institutions are so important, having sound institutions, you know, are going to be invigilating that on behalf of ordinary citizens. So having legislation that touches on, impinges on certain freedoms would have to be renewed at a certain period, otherwise they expire I think by sunset, themselves. I think sunset clauses are really good things. Yeah. Okay. Mm. So, do we have any questions from participants here from Asia? Parminder. Parminder. Uh, yeah, I'm Parminder from an NGO IT for Change uh, in Bangalore. So the issue, I think, is not just uh, a balance or whatever between security and freedoms. I think the issue is that everybody believes that security is a, is a concern. 
but agreeing on what is that core security issues which are the concern, and Patrick tried to outline them. And the problem globally is that while there is an agreement globally that these are issues that everybody agrees, the people who are trying to put additional agendas on the security, uh, security issue. Wolfgang talked about the proposed code of uh, conduct or a proposed convention by Russia, and earlier there was a code of conduct proposed by China and others, and they're trying to put a new phrase called information space security. And they use words like socially disruptive actions inside their countries, and they're trying to use the security logic, uh, which should actually only apply to core network security and the kind of cyber crimes which are universally accepted, to the social, you know, political issues inside the countries. Correspondingly, the Western countries are also very eager to use the IP agenda and mix it with the security agenda. And when I see uh, documents uh, in the West about security, they are talking about real issues and real harms, and suddenly the IP issue would come up, and we should recognize that there is not a complete consensus across the world and even within the Western countries about this new wave of IP enforcement. So rather than, you know, clubbing those agendas with the security agenda, if we focus on a core security agenda, I think there's much more possibility of agreeing and leave IP enforcement out in the IP arena and the social disruptive things where they are. So I think the problem is that we try to make the security agenda much bigger than what it is and that cr creates the problem rather than the fact that there are core concerns in which everybody agrees to. So Let me take you. another question. I think there was a question in the back. Um, and then I'll get some comments from the panel. And just a time check, we have 15 minutes. So if you have a, a burning question, um, please send it to FX Internet um, so we can get a next question as well. So please, go ahead. Uh, yeah, uh, my name is Parisa Kokai and I am from Iran. Actually, I live in Germany, but I am from Iran. Uh, I'm gl glad that I'm here to hear your uh, opinion. But um, during two these, uh, these two days, I heard something about um, democracy, freedom, and something like this, but I think that all of them could be useful for some uh, democratic countries. But uh, for my country, Iran, that uh, everything in internet is blocked and uh, using uh, internet is difficult because uh, speed is so low or something like this, I don't know how all of this discussion could be uh, useful. And um, I mean, uh, some other, some of the uh, Western uh, West uh, uh, companies uh, sell something to uh, my country. Some technologies for spying, for using our information. Uh, for example, yesterday I saw uh, some people from Google, and I have this question: Okay, what's your solution for our people in Iran? For example, when I am here, I can uh, uh, I can um, give my uh, telephone number to uh, Google, and then receive a code and then can control my information in Google. But what's, what's uh, the solution for my people inside of Iran or some other countries with uh, dictatorship and something like this? Thank you very much. Um, I'll, I'll maybe make a comment on in my previous life I used to do kind of technology mm. training for, for activists at risk and I think um, getting to I think some of the points here is the same point that was made in terms of awareness of the threats and the best practices around security for NATO and the business. I think there, there are some efforts, some very great efforts that really have taken off over the last two years, not only funded by CETA, but a variety of other donors and just organizations as well, such as um, EFF that's put together a guide. It's just knowing what some of the, 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 the issues and some very simple steps on, I would say, best practices. Um, so for example, you, you, you mentioned the issue of kind of Google and getting a code on the phone. Um, that's true, but there's also an application you can get on a smartphone, and so I, I think even though they're sanctioned, there's a lot of smartphones that make their way into Iran, and if they load the, the particular uh, iPhone app or Android app that generates a, 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 a two-factor authentication, uh, that's, that's one thing, but there's issues. I would say that there's, there's more in common that we, th that we don't necessarily share. So I think, you know, getting to your point is that we don't do enough sharing across stakeholder groups. So the issues that she's saying that, you know, we have a slow internet, we don't know the, the, the digital security issues. Other people and other stakeholders have developed materials. And right now it's only kind of civil society that's producing the materials. They may not be translated, you may not know about them. 
But NATO and, and the business sector and the technical community, um, and, and maybe the OSCE as well, have developed some great materials as well, and they're not making their way to you and to others. And I think there is a there is a real interest. I mean, my interest would be, um, and as much as the stuff isn't classified, but best practices in terms of um, either how to train people and, and simple steps will also help the businessman who's traveling, who's using his Google account, um, that is similarly a vector. So, um, you know, I maybe want to get to you, Patrick, in terms of, um, for her, that maybe um, in terms of Iran, I mean, what are things in terms of um, things that could be helpful to her as she wants to communicate securely and her friends, but also to get more access? I mean, what, are there any options? Well, I think, first of all, let me just say that this is one, I, I completely agree with the problem statement that we just heard. And this is one of the reasons why I think the first problem we have is to try to increase the amount of communication in the first place. Mm -hmm. And that was also what we heard from Foreign Minister Bildt say yesterday, that, that, uh, that increase in communication is the number one thing, because without communication we will have lots of these problems. This also includes not only the constrained, sort of constrained com uh, countries that we see, but we have tons of countries where we still have not deregulated, for example, the ability to, to take bandwidth across the country boundary, even though you have deregulated the internal market. And that sort of put a wet blanket over the, inc over the price, the cost internally, because everyone has to buy transit from the same upstream provider, which can keep the control and can keep the price high. Okay. So what can you do? Well, the easiest thing to try to do is, of course, to use some kind of VPN connection. For traditional VPN connection, virtual private networks or IP security or something, you open an encrypted tunnel on top of IP on top of internet. But that implies that you need to be able to communicate end to end between the two endpoints, which might not be possible just because of some things that have been done by intermediaries. But then there are other things that are, that are developed, like the Tor network and other kind of overlay networks that can be possible to be used. And I do know that there are a couple of projects going that try to help people making it easier to use these kind, these kind of tools, but, but there are absolutely more things that can be done. Yeah, so uh, a group here, if you've not met them, the Tactical Technology Collective that's here and, and others have some guides and they should get in touch with you. I want to take a, a point from online, so we're talking about some of these issues. Um, can we get another question from the internet? Um, actually, no. No? <laughs> <laughs> the internet's gone <laughs> silent. Yes, the internet is silent, oh yes. <laughs> It's thinking. <laughs> so I, I didn't want to call on you, but it's great. Um, so um, if you want to identify yourself, great. If not, just, just make a yeah. comment. But it's, uh, please go ahead. Yeah. I'm Michael Anti from China. So uh, I'm listen, I listened to the, this debate for, for, for two days. But a little bit from this moment, a little bit of worry about the, the debate. Because uh, um, everything, when you, because China, Basically, these two days, China, not Chinese guy, not involved with debate because basically it's about West war. But, but please pay attention. There is China in the world. Everything you talk about state-to-state -state treaty will eventually go to, you don't talk to China. And China have a veto in UN. Any kind of thing in your in imagination that state can control the internet governance will eventually go to the talk to China and the veto. Basically, and also they will utilize any agenda you raised in the treaty you to Russia or to other things eventually become their own concern. For example, you, you talk a lot of things about security. Chinese government also talk about security. But the definition of security is totally different. But when you raise this term in a state level, you actually you are bro breaking the idea of internet, which is interconnection. Because internet, from the very beginning, is the borderless. But you start think state really should control the internet governance. I think it's a very very bad idea because China is watching you. 
So, so great yeah. comment, and I maybe want to go to you in terms of do you see countries that are really trying to control the, the internet, as in Iran, there's an RFP that was issued a few days ago in terms of having a halal or a national internet. In the case of China, do we see the movement away from a global internet to national internets if we don't solve the, the blocking issue? Do we, we, do we lose our internet if, if, if we can't get these countries to, 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 to play and, and, and connect? I think temporarily, unfortunately, yes. I think it will create more problems. Uh, but on the other hand, I'd, I'm a person that do believe in innovation, and so far innovation has been pretty, been pretty powerful. But I, I, I still think I, I think that um, if we look at like it was brought up yesterday, that internet is something that give growth to to a society. So for a country, anyone that wants to isolate themselves is something that will impact the society and the country itself, which means that any kind of, of limitation of communication across national boundaries is something that I think will backfire on the society itself. But short term, yes, we will, it, it will create problems. What, what will create problems? Having a treaty or not having a treaty? To, to, uh, to, to isolate Internet. to divide the internet into Absolutely. national networks. Absolutely. Absolutely. No. I mean, I'm thoroughly mm. against the notion of territorialization. And my great fear about having treaties of a bilateral kind is that it's actually where it would probably mm. lead us. I think on the whole, at the moment, until we can actually demonstrate to ourselves that, uh, that treaties of that kind, or indeed, frankly, moving, moving some of these issues into the UN, where there are two countries with a, with a Security Council veto, which are no, not, I think, on the side of a free internet, uh, it's, a, it's better to continue with the governance systems we got, try to develop them, make them more open, uh, and, uh, and get consensus around them. Um, no, the, I don't think the world is yet you know, mature for the kind of international governments which one could really trust to do it on the basis of lots of, of arrangements between governments to there. I mean, I've heard a lot of people feel, you know, government's the enemy in all of this. I mean, I've worked for government, I don't they actually think, no, it is entirely the enemy in all of this, but we do represent dangers. Uh, so, you know, uh, I think that the private sector and the suppliers have done a great job, actually, so far, in, re in, in constructing an internet that's reasonably reliable and actually reasonably free. There are improvements that can be made, but I'm in favour of actually staying broadly where we are, rather than actually changing the whole basis at the so, moment So, of looking, at the, looking at the clock, we have four minutes. Two minutes. Okay. One last question from the internet. Do we have a question from the internet at all? Um, basically, I think currently the feed is discussing the, the thing with China watching. <laughs> I, I, think, I, I think that's actually a, um, something that should be taken seriously, according to Twitter. Can I? Can yeah. I? Yeah. Yeah. Just, just on the Chinese thing, absolutely. I mean, China <coughs> today has the largest number of internet users in the world. That probably will grow. And uh, ch ch Chinese buying to any kind of international set of confidence building measures is, is critical. Uh, without Chinese participation, they simply won't work. Uh, that said, totally when agree. When they'll do it. When they'll do it. When they'll do it. That said, uh, I totally agree with Patrick. China's yeah. economic growth has coincided with opening up and integrating in to global society, into the global economy, uh, and therefore any kind of, sort of Baidu sort of dominated uh, national uh, uh, network, I think in the short, in the long run would be detrimental to, to, to that type of growth. Um, the, the thing, however, is two things. We need, first of all, uh, a framework for governments to start sitting down and talking about these issues. We don't have it. The Brits tried to start something at London well, last so year, it's Lancaster continuing. House. No, but we need to follow up now, mm. Budapest, mm. Korea, and get that framework and, and agenda of issues established. The so, second thing, no, let, let me finish. So this we is, have, is we, we have need have. a, a a, a, a track to dialogue with China. We need, you know, problems in international security are solved because governments have quiet, confidential track to dialogues uh, and, and gradually build up confidence and, and knowledge and get a sense of we, where fears and, and you don't agree with me, no. Pauline. No. I, 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 well, yeah, I think we do. Don't, I, as the moderator, I, I see yeah. I have one burning question. Can we take one more question from the floor? No. Okay. So um, apologies to those. I've tried my best to take questions online. Um, I know that this is something probably that we, we were just kind of warming up now over probably the last uh, 
45 minutes and really getting into the issues of, of China and other issues as well. Um, it's a rare opportunity to be on a panel that has um, both people that, that help those that um, um, are under repression and, and trying to be their voice and be their support um, with those that are the technical en engineers that put it together, those that have considerable experience in, in multiple levels of government, and, and uh, folks from, I would say, defense or, or NATO. It's a rare combination and really thanking um, the organizers to put this together. We did have a guest who couldn't come from, from Libya, and it would have been interesting to hear kind of his voice in, in a country that's really changed um, the whole, whole kind of security view as well. Um, so if you have any more questions, continue them online on FX Internet. Um, I thank you uh, for your time, your patience, and I'll turn it over to, uh, to Johan for any last-minute comments and our instructions after this panel. Thank you so much.